all around the world, archaeologists have discovered that ancient monuments that have stood the test of time align with the sun. The Great Temple Complex of Karnak in Egypt appears to be oriented to the direction of the summer solstice. The famous Machu Picchu site in Peru was associated with an Inca cult that worshipped the sun. And in Europe, the stones of Stonehenge show an alignment to the appearance of the sun during the summer and winter solstice. This worldly worship of the sun was important to the ancient people. But why? What significance did our current sun play in the lives of the ancients? And how can their documentation of a sun god lead to a better understanding of the universe we live in today? In 2008, NASA launched its Interstellar Boundary Explorer, or IBEX. This satellite uses energetic, neutral atoms to image the interaction region between the solar system and interstellar space. Shortly after its launch, it detected something scientists had never seen before. A thin slice or ribbon of energy and particles were discovered in the heliosphere. This new finding overturned 40 years of theory and provided insight into the fundamental structure of the heliosphere. According to NASA, this will help scientists understand structures that surround our solar system and other star systems throughout the galaxy. According to Wallace Thornhill, this is proof of the electric universe theory. The sun gets its power, like all of the rest of the stars in the galaxy, from the electric currents flowing along the spiral arms and into the center. It's part of Alphane's circuit, and as such, it collects electrical energy from one of these Birkeland current filaments, which must surround the solar system. The evidence for this has been found recently with the IBEX mission, which found there's a ring of bright spots out well beyond the heliosphere. So our connection to the galaxy has been discovered, but it's not understood. There was a lot of surprises as a result of that. And I spoke to the, the fellow who was in charge of the experiment. And he said that when it was discovered, there were a lot of theories about what would be found and there were predictions. None of the predictions proved to be correct and they gave up predicting at some point as the results came back in. The puzzle is that there are these bright spots in a ring around the solar system, and this is where the sun's circuit, remember the solar wind is a current sheet and it flows outwards in all directions, where it hits the filaments going past the sun, it's like searchlight beams through a cloud. Where they hit the cloud, they light up. And so this is what they've discovered. And they were amazed because these bright spots move and change with time. This is totally inexplicable in any standard thinking and remains a mystery. But it is a part of the signature of the electrical connection of the sun to the galaxy. Prior to the IBEX mission, most scientists believed that the global boundaries of our solar system were controlled mainly by the motion of our solar system through the galaxy and the solar wind, which is an extremely fast flow of electrically charged matter that flows out of the sun. The IBEX maps revealed the galactic magnetic field is also a critical part of the sun's interaction with the galaxy. The spacecraft was organized to scan the sky and find out where they were coming from and their energies. So it was a big surprise when this ring, which was aligned with the interstellar external magnetic field, and remember, electric currents follow the magnetic field. So what the IBEX mission and the Cassini spacecraft were detecting were returns from bare hydrogen atom nuclei, the protons, picking up electrons from the current that was surrounding the solar system and then circling around in the magnetic field and some of them returning back into the solar system so the spacecraft could detect them. This was confirmation of the electrical circuit of a star, something that Hans Alfein decades earlier had shown was necessary to explain the solar wind itself. The electrical model of stars has a picture of how the circuit works. 
and every charged object in plasma surrounds itself with a cell wall that's almost biological in its overtones. That cell wall is what's known as a plasma double layer or a plasma sheath and they were identified by the Nobel Prize winning Irving Langmuir in the early 20th century. The plasma sheath is a place where most of the electric field is to be found. It's only strong within the so-called double layers or plasma sheaths. So I predicted that when the Voyager spacecraft reached the boundary of the solar system, the effects would not be that of just a plain bow wave effect, you know, trying to plow through the interstellar medium. And this was borne out. To begin with, the solar wind seemed to slow to a halt, and that's because there's a reverse field very close to the boundary. And then once passing through that area, there is a voltage drop which is associated with cosmic rays. All of these things were fulfilled by Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, as of this date, is currently experiencing that same boundary in a different direction from the sun. So all of these things were supportive of the electric universe, but none of them were as powerful as the discovery of this strange ring around the solar system by the IBEX mission. How does this discovery explain how the sun interacts with the rest of the universe? The electric universe theory explains this by going back to the birth of a star. In the electric universe, galaxies are an electromagnetic phenomenon, not a gravitational phenomenon. And this is why astronomers have so much difficulty and have to invent dark matter and so on to try and uh, patch up Newton's law of gravity. Once you accept electrical activity and electric circuits in space, as suggested strongly by Hans Alfvén, you realize that we have a, an entirely different mechanism for forming stars. We're not talking about gravity anymore, we're talking about electric currents. And electric currents in space take a form known as a Birkeland current, which is twin filaments. In deep space, the amount of matter per cubic meter, in other words, the density of material is extremely low. It's counted in sort of atoms per cubic meter. It's the best vacuum that we know of. So an electric current flowing in deep space in between galaxies or between stars can only carry very little current, but the sheer size of these current filaments can be light years across. When they're that size, they don't radiate any visible light, but they do give off radio signals, which are detected by radio telescopes. When these filaments arrive at a a cloud of uh, denser material known as a molecular cloud in a galaxy. The effect is to cause the current because it can now flow through a smaller aperture, if you like. It constricts in, it's called the electromagnetic pinch effect. As it comes in more and more narrowly, if there's sufficient material, the current density gets to the point where atoms begin to give off light. And the problem for many years uh, dogged astronomers was that they couldn't see inside these clouds. Visible light can't get through all of the dust and material. With the advent of infrared space telescopes, which could see through the clouds, astronomers were amazed to find these glowing filaments. They are the signatures of these galactic current circuits. Now, the pinch effect is one which allows the electric current to draw inwards surrounding material, and it does it far more effectively than gravity. And because it's doing it along a line and not from a point, gravity always operates from a point source of mass, it collects material very well. It's an ex extremely good kind of vacuum cleaner, if you like, in space. And all the material needed to make stars and planets are drawn together along this filament. Our sun was formed along one of these filaments. And as it turns out, because they're twin filaments, it's usually a pair of stars at the same time and the uh, two of them are rotating around one another. Some stars, any other object or any other filament that's nearby will not form a partner with these two. It'll be independent and you get single stars formed along them. Now the sun may be one of these single stars because it's known by astronomers that binary stars are present in remarkable numbers. And it's always been a puzzle. Why is this so? Why uh, are stars found in so many pairs instead of uh, single stars? Once the stars are formed, they become quite heavy, of course, over this formation period. And the filaments, just like in a novelty plasma ball, are moving 
waving, snaking about. And at some point, the stars are left behind and the filament moves on. So then you have all of these bodies in a line, but they all have their own motions, which can be either around each other or it's a little random. In the laboratory, it was described to me by a top plasma physicist, the effect is like they scatter like buckshot. So after the event, stars are scattered in all directions, away from the central axis, and planets are formed at the same time, so all of the heavy elements that form planets put in place in, by the same mechanism. And they form partnerships. Because the electrogravitic model of uh, interaction between celestial bodies shows that uh, gravity is long-range repulsive and short-range attractive. Stars being an electrical phenomenon, they continue to shine because the electric current flowing through these clouds is everywhere. There are minor filaments alongside major ones. So the stars then shine according to their environment. In the case of the sun, it doesn't seem to have needed to do anything dramatic to continue to survive after its birth. How are we connected to the same force as the sun? The Birkeland currents transfer electrical energy to the planets because we're all part of the same circuit of the sun. The other form of energy is electromagnetic, which is slow and it's a wave, like a wave in the end of a rope. When you do that, it takes time for the energy to get to the other end and you detect the fact that the other person is waving it at you. But if the rope is taut, which is the electric force, you give a tug on this and the person at the other end feels it immediately. That's the difference. And the universe is connected by this direct force. This is like we're all connected by invisible strings. This is the answer to the puzzle of quantum entanglement. How can you separate two particles by hundreds of kilometers and you flip one and the other one instantly knows to flip? The system has to be in balance.